I'm Richard Knowles, and I welcome you to Module 4 of this course, Leading and Using the Process Enneagram. In this module, I'll share some case studies that illustrate the use of the Process Enneagram and how well it works. But first, I want to share some feedback and testimonials about this Process Enneagram from, with some of the people with whom I've worked. Tim McDaniel from St. Petersburg, Florida, has spent years successfully managing safety efforts in Siemens. He's now working to bring the safety work to the next higher level. Most of his thinking comes out of his successes over the years at Siemens, but now he's also including the work of Eric Hallnagel's Safety 2, which brings a more positive, holistic approach to understand safety performance and improve it to reduce injuries and incidents. The partner-centered leadership that I talk about in this online course, Leading and Using the Process Enneagram, provides the thinking and the tools that are needed to bring this safety to and put it into place in real workplace environments. Tom says, Dick Knowles has the most effective process for understanding and measuring leadership and its advancement. His knowledge on this subject is outstanding. He brings clarity to what many are already doing in an ad hoc method, but by seeing this relationship distinction, it can only help you and your organization move further along. I know he's written a couple of books about this. He has helped many organizations succeed. Another person with whom I worked is Tim Dalmo, who lives in Brisbane, Australia, and has been using the Process Enneagram in his work since I introduced it to him in 1996. Tim says, I'm honored to be a colleague of Dick Knowles. I've been with Dick as he uses this approach in safety leadership and business performance leadership. I've used Dick's process Enneagram process in companies and communities in Australia, South Africa, Nambia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, Mexico, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, China, Germany, and Indonesia, with groups as diverse as coal miners and steel makers, to lawyers, accountants, and those charged with shaping the future of South Africa for the next 20 years. In every single case, I've seen results achieved that would have been unheard of using other processes. Another person with whom I work is Chet Brandon. <clears throat> He's the global HSE leader for manufacturing operations for specialty metals. I like many features of your work. I think it starts with your wonderful experience as a plant manager in heavy industry. There's tremendous power in having walked the walk. Also, your vision of understanding safety in the context of a network of complex systems, social, technical, regulatory, organizational, individual, is innovative and attuned to the future of work. Paramount to the concept is the understanding of predicting and influencing outcomes generated by these systems. In the case of safety in the occupational environment, the desired outcome, of course, is safe work and advancing the business objectives of the organization. In my considerable experience in the field of industrial health and safety, over 25 years, you have a truly unique and effective point of view. That's what I like about your work. I want to now just take a moment to review what we did in Module 3 to bring us up. Here's the agenda for our module today. I'll share these case studies with you. One on safety improvement at the Invictus Sugar Mill in Air, Australia. Another sharing worst case scenarios with the residents of the Kanawha Valley. I'll talk about safety improvement at a fabrication plant, truck fabrication plant. Talk about the Niagara Falls leadership team and how their effectiveness works so well for the city. And wind up talking about the Geelong Wire Mill in Australia. The use of the process Enneagram in all these cases helped the people to get better to do the work that they needed to be doing. The first case study is 
of the Invicta Sugar Mill in Air, Australia. The blue arrow points to where that is in Australia. Australia is a big country. It's up in northeastern part of Queensland. This is the CSR Sugar Mill. CSR is the acronym for Colonial Sugar Refiners. They now also do a lot of work on building products as well. But Queensland produces about 5% of the world's sugar output. Sugar growing region is along the coast of the Coral Sea near Townsville where there's a lot of rainfall and a lot of good farmland. And as I said, the blue arrow points to the region in which we were working. This work at the Invicta Sugar Mill was quite impressive for me. They processed about 25,000 tons a day of sugar cane and produced about 65 railroad cars a day of raw sugar. It was a huge, huge operation. They had about 350 people working at the mill and they were having 30 to 35 serious injuries a year and killing somebody every 12 to 18 months. And the attitude was, well, bad stuff happens. CSR had hundreds of kilometers of narrow gauge railroad woven out among the sugarcane fields to bring in the fresh sugarcane to the mill right after it was cut. And they had to process sugarcane within about 12 hours of when it was cut or else the sugar, cane, sugar level in the cane starts to drop and they lose yield. They worked very closely with the farmers throughout the growing season and the harvesting process. I worked with them for about nine days in 1999. Part of the time was three and a half days in workshops with 30 to 35 people, including folks who swept the floor all the way to the mill manager. And I spent a number of days walking around the mill, talking with people, listening, sharing what they were doing in their work, talking about all sorts of things together, building relationships, helping them see that they could do things better and better. And overall, in that course of the time there, I interacted directly with 70 to 80 people. The mill manager, Jerry McGrath, and his 23 supervisors met weekly to review the process after we left. But we worked closely with the people, spent a lot of time talking together and sharing and listening and trying to understand each other. Now, I worked in all 10 of the sugar mills for CSR. And one of the things I found quite interesting was that the work practices from one mill to the next were almost identical. They were handling lots of sugar cane and hurting lots of people. And I did process enneagram workshops at each mill. Most of the workshops went for two and a half days, and so I could do two mills a week, which was really very hard, heavy work. The longest workshop I did was the one here with the Invicta Sugar Mill in Air, Australia. When I got done with the working in the mills, I put the process enneagram maps of all of them together because they were all so similar. They were almost <clears throat> carbon copies of one another. You could lay them on top of each other. So I want to share what the maps look like with you in good detail. The first mill that we worked on was looking at the question, what is safety like at the CSR sugar mills? And we talked together, all of us in the room, about our identity. Safety was intensity by supervision isn't felt. They reward crisis management. There are different cultures of crushing, maintenance, transport, and whatnot. Safety is a top-down process. It's production first. We have a us versus them culture. Lots of procedures that are poorly followed. The first line people need a lot of training and support. Communications is spotty, inconsistent, and often unclear. We send mixed messages, and there's strong resistance to top-down driven processes. And there's ill will in the organization, and lots of it comes from the top, and much of it is not followed through. So this is what they said they were, their current identity was that morning as we got together and talked. 
And then they said what they really like to see is safety being number one with no one getting hurt, everyone involved and feeling responsible. Safety is a way of life and a part of all we do. Everyone looks after each other and proud of our mill. We have clear, consistent procedures that we all follow. There are no mixed messages. A safe and healthy workplace is desired. We all focus on improving safety. We have good reporting and learning from injuries and incidents. So this is what the group of 35 people from the sweepers on the floor to the mill manager would tell me what they really wanted to do. So I said, well, why aren't you there? Well, we got a lot of problems, production versus safety, slow response to safety issues. The discipline's difficult. We have time and cost pressures. We have old mills that need a lot of maintenance. We have a seasonal workforce, few maintenance dollars. There's a poor understanding of policies and procedures. There's a burdensome poor paper load. There are poor work attitudes. Standards and rules are constantly changing. There's too much micromanagement. They'd rather take risks than change. And then the occupational and safety problems of dust and high noise were a problem as well. And then I asked them, well, what are your relationships like here? Well, there's low levels of trust. It's adversarial. There's little safety credibility. And there's a fear of mistakes because we get punished when there's a mistake. And I said, okay, what are your ground rules? You're working together. What are your principles and standards? Well, we can't stop all injuries. Shortcuts are okay. We have inconsistent, wishy-washy, permissive procedures. We don't listen, value, and respect each other. We don't take care of each other. We love firefighters. There's no praise or positive reinforcement. And we take the piss out of each other. So it's no wonder that their mill is performing poorly when they have this kind of set of ground rules about how they're working together. And so then I asked, okay, what kind of work are you doing on safety? We're training, doing toolbox meetings, doing audits, work procedures. All of their work is around procedures and equipment. There's hardly anything around what the people are doing and how they are together. I asked about information. How do you create it and share it? There's not enough on the bottom of the safety triangle. Work information gets piled up and it gets filtered, so it's not clear to us at all. We have a safety newsletter. There's inconsistent feedback. The safety information is not shared among all the mills. And we're poorly organized and too complicated. So their information is not useful for most of the people in the mills. How do you learn? Well, we do some buddy training and reinduction training, but it's pretty superficial. We have serious injury reports, a little deep learning, and most of their training they characterized as sheep dip. In Australia, they have a process on the sheep branches that when they need to put insecticide into the sheep's wool to keep away the flies, they'll put some water-soluble insecticide into water in a pit, have the sheep walk through the pit and get totally covered with it, and then they walk out, and after a while, it wears off, and then they go back and they run them through the sheep dip again. And they saw their training courses as if it was like sheep dip, over and over and over, and it kept wearing off with little reinforcement. We talked a little bit about the outside world, the context. They were in a tough, competitive sugar market. It's a global market they're in. The price was about five cents a pound, which was very tough on them. But they had world-class cost in manufacturing in the mills, and so they were able to make some money. Internally, they were top-down in their management approach. Programs were imposed. There were few involvement teams. And the union filled the management void. So in the morning, we would have created this picture of what is safety like in this mill. We did that with about 35 people. Then after lunch, we come together again, and we create a new map. And the new map is taking a look at the question, how can safety be like in the CSR mills? <coughs> 
the identity and the intention were virtually the same as what we developed in the morning. They didn't change. But now we followed the inner lines and we moved from intention to principles and standards. Safety is number one. We have agreed consulted set of rules with consequences, pluses and minuses. We have persistence at this work. We're going to be honest. Everybody is personally responsible to be consistent and fair. We listen. We have good reinduction and training at all levels. We seek understanding and share. We use and apply the safety rules. We participate and promote participation and commitment. And we help each other through the culture change. So they all recognize, this is their words that they created, the people in the mill, that this is the way in which they have to live together in order to fulfill their intention. And then we took a look at the tensions and issues. A lot of the ones that had been there from the morning disappeared. But there are still ones like old mills and a lot of paperwork, production versus safety, the big gas and noise problems. But these are the things now that they can talk about together using their new principles and standards and find better ways to work together so they can have both good costs and good safety, for example. And as we work together this way, their trust would be building, they'd become interdependent, and they'd be helping each other. We then looked across at the structure. They're going to be proactive in making a safer workplace. Management will set the goals and drive the processes. Teams will be developed and used for safety procedures to achieve higher levels of performance. So their structure is shifting from the top-down process to one that involves more teams and more participation. And the outside world is the same as before. It's a highly competitive, tough market. The work they're doing is going to be con continuing to do some of what they've already been doing, but they're also going to begin to doing more looking at the way people are working together. So they're going to do safe acts audits. They're going to reduce hand, back, and eye injuries and form some teams to work on that. They're going to have a work permit team so that that is going to be more consistent and safer. And they'll have risk assessment teams. They'll, unidenti they'll identify unsafe behaviors and the processes that are driving those. And they're going to praise for good performance. Their learning is going to change. They're going to walk the talk. They're going to post and review the map that they've created, this map, and talk about it. They'll be doing safe acts audits. They'll spend time with the people. We can work together, so let's keep going. And the information is going to be sharing all safety information, providing much more feedback up and down and across the organization. And there'll be more information about the bottom of the triangle. So in the afternoon, we created this picture of how they could be at this mill and how they could work together if they wanted to. And they posted this map, and they began to talk about it and began to use it. And here's a picture of their safety performance coming out of the workshop. In Australia, they keep track of their injury rates based on a million exposure hours versus 200,000 in the U.S. So on the left-hand side part of this chart, they're operating at a total recordable injury rate of about 65 based on the million hours, or about 12 based on the uh, 200,000 hours. But then you see we had the workshop, and the injury performance immediately improved and dropped quite dramatically. And they had one upset in November of 99, but then they went on and worked with no injuries for the rest of the period shown here. This is all through the cutting and the harvesting season. I lost track of it afterwards beyond this, but this shows how quickly the shift could occur as people decide to work together in a different kind of a way. It was very powerful, very positive. And it was a lot of fun to know that they were working better and not having people get killed in the workplace. 
The next case study I want to share with you is about sharing worst-case scenarios in the Kanawha Valley in West Virginia. This was requested by the South Charleston Community Advisory Council. They wanted to know, they asked the plants, tell us what your worst-case scenario is. What happens when your most toxic material gets spilled out onto the ground and the toxic cloud moves into the community? And this was for the whole greater Charleston region in West Virginia, and there are about 300,000 people there. And this is, was along the Kanawha Valley, River Valley, for about 20 miles. So it was a big area over which we were working with a lot of people. There were eight different chemical companies and 13 different chemical plants involved in the industry in the valley. And the plants all worked quite independently. We there was no co-management or anything like that going on. We had a highly critical media, and it was relentless in the criticism. And every day there would be things in the paper about one or the other of us. And often it was quite personal, and I got my hide taken off a few times. There was little trust between the communities and the plants. And unfortunately, there was some history of explosions, releases, and the need to shelter in place. Not very many, but just enough to keep everybody on edge. And we, in the industry, handled some highly hazardous materials in quite large quantities. For example, at the Bell plant, where I was the manager, we had a 20,000-ton anhydrous ammonia storage tank. At Rome Palenque down the valley, they had about 3 or 4 million pounds of methyl isocyanate. That's the material that escaped in Bhopal, India, and killed so many people. And the people lived right across the chain link fence from the storage area. Sharing like this had never been done on this scale. It was the first time for any of us in the industry anywhere near this kind of activity to be taking place. The EPA had no guidance on how to do it, so the plants were on our own. We had to figure it out ourselves. And one of the things I did, I was the leader of this behind the scenes. I'd learned how to work with the communities in Niagara Falls. Running a chemical plant in Niagara Falls within the shadow of Love Canal was a big educational experience. I'm the only plant manager in DuPont to take the EPA to court, and we beat them up to the Niagara Falls. So I knew how to work with the communities and what we needed to be doing as we were working together. So I used a process enneagram as a way to help me guide my own thinking. I didn't share it with the whole group, but I, I used it as my guide through all this two-year process that we did to culminate it. And we knew we needed to build trust. We needed more interdependence with the communities that in which we were involved. And so we decided, going across to the structure and context, we had to have two committees, one a technical committee which would calculate and make decisions about which chemicals are we talking about, how much are we talking about, how toxic are they, what wind speeds should we use in the calculations, what concentrations should we use to talk about where injuries and fatalities might occur. That group was supported by a DuPont expert in process safety management but he stayed in the background, and it was led by a person in the community. The communications committee looked at how do we actually put this together? How do we do it in a way that makes sense to the people and be intelligible? How can we be consistent among the plants so the people aren't going to get confused with different ways of presentation? When should we do it? How should we do it? And that committee was chaired by a community person I stayed in the background. I was very active in that committee all the time. So we had community people visibly leading the efforts. All the plants were involved, as long as the CMA and the EPA. And we involved school children. Because I had found that having school children that participate in the meetings resulted in the adults behaving a lot better. And we were much more focused and deliberate in what we were doing. So the work we had to do was to form the committees, develop the technology, coordinate locally and nationally, 
Build relationships and credibility. Make the messages understandable. Have third-party involvement and leadership for credibility. And we had to get the local emergency planning committees into the leadership positions. So we had to go to talk to them and convince them that they needed to lead this effort. We would support them, but they needed to lead it. And as we look at our learning, we were co-creating a future that would be very, very powerful. And information, the plants, the communities, we're going to create it together and openly share it. So that was the process Enneagram map that I kept in the background as I was working with the people and helping to coordinate this entire effort. Now going through this effort and bringing the managers together was a heck of a challenge because when the local emergency planning committee in South Charleston asked Rome Polonc for their worst case scenarios and asked all of us for our worst case scenarios, the managers all rebelled. They weren't going to do it. We're not talking to the people. It's none of their business. But having worked in the community in Niagara Falls near Love Canal with a dump that was bigger than Love Canal, a DuPont dump, I learned how to work with the communities and I knew we had to be talking with the people. We had to be working together. So I insisted that we do this. And we had several contentious meetings among the plant managers. And they finally came along the day after one of them had an explosion on their plant and killed a person and required the community to shelter in place. And at that point they said, okay, we're going to do it together. We'll all come along. But it was always one of these events where they're kicking and screaming as we're coming along. I've been able to establish some good relationships with the people who were leading these community groups. And I was talking to the co-leader co of the Citizens Concerned About Methyl Isocyanate, Mrs. Mildred Holt, a wonderful, kind lady. And I was letting my hair down and talking about how tough it was and how the managers were roughing me up. And she looked at me very kindly and she said, we know you guys can kill us. We want to know what you're doing to prevent it. That changed everything because we had been focusing at all the worst case scenarios and all the negative aspects rather than looking at all the things we were doing for prevention. And all of us were doing a lot and we were doing really pretty well, all things considered. So that informal conversation with Mrs. Holt made a huge, huge difference in our work. And it only came about because she was kind enough to tell me the truth. And that was so very, very powerful. All this work came together in an event we called Safety Street on June 6th and 7th in 1995. Together. And the town center mall is about three stories high and about two city blocks long. It's a big mall. Each plant had their own display. We had our tables set up throughout the mall in the hallways. So as people were circulating and shopping, they could stop at any plant's display and talk with the plant manager and people and their staff. And there was a lot of that going on. And we talked with the public from about 10 a.m. until about 6 p.m. And I'm sure that it was probably the longest time that any plant manager had spent in a mall in their whole life. But they were all there, and they were all actively engaged. And we had conversations with maybe five to 7,000 people. We really don't know the specific number, but there were lots and lots of shoppers. The mall was filled with people. And the plants told a community of 300,000 people 29 ways we could kill them, and trust went up. And a London Times reporter at the end of the day pulled me aside You've done something amazing here in a community that has been very, very troubled. So I felt pretty good about having that kind of a comment and feedback from the London Times reporter. So we had done some things here that were really terrific. It had made a great impact, a positive impact on the community. And the environmentalists were telling people, we've made great steps here, we've got to do more, but the plants have really been coming together and we're making a lot of progress. So it was a positive experience, but one in which we had to use something like the process Enneagram to tie it together, or we would have been totally lost in trying to keep this going and focused. 
The next scenario I want to talk with you about is one from a truck fabrication facility. This is a facility where Claire, my wife, and my partner did a two-day workshop to help them improve safety. In this factory, they bring in a truck chassis. They have about 35 people in the plant. They bring in four chassis a month. And they build the tanks and the pumps and the meters onto the chassis so the truck can then deliver liquid explosives to construction, mining, and quarry sites around the country. These are orders specifically. They're custom made to meet the needs of specific customers. And they're very nicely done. As I say, they were building about four a month. And they were having five to six OSHA recordable injuries a year, which is a very high rate for a group of only 35 people. So we were asked to come and help them improve the safety performance. So we had one day there. We spent a total of two days. The first day was spent where Claire and I were walking around, talking with the men and the women, learning about how they were doing things, letting them show us the beautiful quality of the work that they were doing, which was really nice. We had pizza together in the break room, chatted together about families, and spent the day really connecting with the people so that they were comfortable with us and we could begin to work on the safety. And then we had a one-day process Enneagram workshop with them. So they were all gathered together that morning. And I said, okay, we're going to be working on safety today. And the groans and the moans over the thought of a whole day on safety was just overwhelming. But we moved forward. And we put together a process Enneagram, all of them participating, all of them joining in and talking about things. And not only did safety problems start to emerge, but there were problems about other things going on. And by the end of the day, they had formed five teams, one to work on weld quality, one to work on communications between the designers and the welders, one to work on safety, one to work on workflow management, and another on customer service. And they all came together during the course of that day focusing on the needs that had surfaced. It wasn't just safety. Safety is a part of it, and everything's connected to everything else. And the manager agreed that the teams could meet weekly for one hour on company time, and their progress was posted on ch charts next to the break room so everybody could see how things were going, what they were accomplishing, what, was, what, would be, what people were doing. So it was very open and very involved and very active. Now they've been experiencing about, since that time, one, they experienced only one OSHA recordable injury in the three years since we did the workshop. Their injury rate immediately went to zero. After a year they had one injury and then they've been injury free for two years. Projected on their previous performance, they would have had 15 to 18 recordable injuries. They only had one. So everything changed, and it changed very quickly. And it wasn't just safety, but it was everything else about how they were working together. So the total performance of the organization got better and better and better. The next case study is to look at the Niagara Falls leadership team with the question, how can we be the best leaders for our city? Mayor Elia, mayor-elect and her leadership team asked me to do a process Enneagram workshop with them one evening, a couple of days before they were all inaugurated into their new positions. And we were looking at this question, how can we be the best leadership team? And so here's the process Enneagram map that we put together that night. And we talked together about who are we. We talked about being innovative and reliable and positive thinkers and servants for the city. We have a clean slate. We don't have a lot of history. We talked about our intention. We want to have a vision for betterment, have a holistic understanding of the budget, have clear roles. We want to be a learning organization and have be more effective. We want to strengthen HR performance and standards, improve the cost effectiveness, be more professional and credible in the government, focus on customer service and be an honest government, improve the quality of life in Niagara Falls, 
improve the positive attitude and image and culture, do things efficiently and do a job well done. This represented an enormous culture shift for the city of Niagara Falls that has been plagued by years and years of stagnation and organized crime problems in the city and in the government. So this was a huge shift that they were talking about making in the way in which the city was being led. And the city has lost population over the last 50 years at about 1% a year. So over half the people of the city of Niagara Falls are either on public assistance or on pensions. And a lot of the industry has gotten weaker and some of it has moved away to the Gulf Coast. So this intention that they created was quite powerful and innovative. And to do that, they said they wanted to operate with these principles and standards, being honest and loyal and respectful, listening to people, communicating clearly, being visible, and positively engaging, caring for each other. They wanted to work this way so that they could fulfill this intention. And the issues and ambiguities they were in was one where we were dealing with the old culture that I described versus the new culture that they wanted to create. There was an attitude in the city of entitlement. People wanted more and more services and less and less taxes. And since so many of the people were on public assistance or pensions, there was not a lot of resources in the city to do much different than keep asking for lower taxes. And there was a need also to establish themselves as a team, which would be new. As they do that, their relationships become more interdependent and they develop more trust. And when we go across and look at how they want to be organized, they wanted to be a team. They wanted to use ad hoc teams as appropriate for specific issues as they came up. And they had wanted to have an environment of helping each other. We didn't talk about context, but the context is the county and state government. And both of them look at quite negatively at the city of Niagara Falls because of the long history of crime and corruption. The work they wanted to do together is shown here. Weekly leadership team meetings. That hadn't been done before. They wanted to attend city council meetings so they could be there to answer questions of the council members as they came up. They needed to be aware of the discussions coming up so they could be prepared. They wanted to establish clarity of the standards, identify the needed management training they needed. So they were talking about doing these things to help them get better and better so they could fulfill this intention. And they committed to spending the 30 minutes a week in talking about how they were doing against this map they've created. And each week at the beginning, the city manager would look at the map which they had enlarged and posted on a four by eight sheet on the wall. And he asked each person to talk for a minute or two, how are we doing against what we said? Is there something different we need to add? Is there a change we need to make? And each person would talk. And this kept the awareness of this very high among all the people. And it kept reminding them of the agreements that they made and how they were gonna to work together. And they were sharing information They were being proactive. They were keeping the mayor, Irene, and fully informed. So they used this map as a way for them to guide themselves as they led the city. I served as consultant, but I wasn't there for more than about half of the meetings, but they continued this process, and the city manager did a great job in keeping their awareness up around this. And coming out of this, services for the city improved and they took $16 million out of a $62 million budget. They did not have to raise taxes for three years. So it was quite a difference in the impact on the city that they were able to make. It was very beneficial. So using this map, in just an hour and a half or two hours we created it, the city had a great benefit from their work. The next case study is about the BHP Geelong Wire Mill. BHP is a big company in Australia that makes steel and other things. A wire mill is a place where they make wire and reinforcing bar and things of that nature. 
And I had the opportunity with Tim Delmo to work with the management team and the union officers in a four-day workshop using the process Enneagram as a core process. There was a lot of tension between the management team and the union leaders, and they were often arguing on everything. It was very difficult as we started out. But as times progressed, things got quite a bit less tense, and they were learning to work together in a different way. And about six months later, I had the opportunity to visit the mill. And I was looking at their wall chart filled with run charts of all sorts, quality, productivity, electric, electricity consumption, levels of waste, all those kind of things. And I was struck that every one of the run charts had an inflection point to the positive direction showing improvement that happened just after the workshop. And the mill manager was there with me looking at the charts and we were talking about them. I said, boy, you all really got a lot out of the workshop. He said, we didn't talk about any of this stuff in the workshop. So I said, why do all the run charts show a positive inflection point right after the workshop? He got real quiet, he looked at it, and he says, oh, he was stunned. He hadn't made that connection to see that the things we had done to work together to get clarity, to use the process Enneagram so they knew where they were going, would have such a huge impact on the hard stuff that we were looking at there on the wall. It was an amazing sort of a thing to see that his eyes open. He was a smart guy, and he was quite proactive, but he was really stunned by this. The process Enneagram is a meta model for harmonizing the natural patterns and processes for self-organization and how people come together to quickly and effectively address questions, solve complex problems, and make decisions. The doing of the work. I think all human activity follows the process Enneagram meta model. So as we learn how to use that, we can get much, much stronger. So today in this module, we've looked at case studies, and we looked at the power of bringing the natural processes of self-organization into harmony with the natural process of how work gets done, releasing energy and creativity quickly, improving the performance of all the organization. It's a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for the organization and a win-win for the people. We bring the people side of the business together with the business side, and they're interwoven and dynamical as they merge and move together. In Module 5, I'll share another case study with you, talk about sleepwalking, and share some more thoughts about leadership. And just as a reminder, here's the course schedule. We've now been through four modules. Module 5 coming up will be around transformation and waking up. Module 6 about creating safe conditions and partner-centered leadership. Now before we move into model, Module 5, I'd like you to think about a couple of questions and ideas. I'd like you to list for me four to five insights you've gained from learning about these case studies. Look at the insights that apply across a number of the studies. What are the common themes running through them? And do you see how partner-centered leadership plays such an important role in all of these case studies? Well, thank you very, very much. I'll be seeing you in Module 5.